You know what's even better than drinking a delicious International Delight iced coffee? Winning a brand new car to drink it in. Visit internationaldelightcarsweeps.com for rules and enter through November 10th for your chance to win a new car plus a year's supply of iced coffee. No purchase necessary. Years worth of product awarded as product and coupons. Valued at $978.20. Open to legal residents of US and DC. Excluding Alaska, Connecticut, New Jersey, Nevada, Hawaii, Tennessee, and Wisconsin. Who are at least 18 in age of majority. Ends October 10th, 2024. Sponsored by Danone US LLC. For official rules, visit internationaldelightcarsweeps.com. My dad works in B2B marketing. He came by my school for career day and said he was a big ROAS man. Then he told everyone how much he loved calculating his return on ad spend. My friends still laugh at me to this day. Not everyone gets B2B, but with LinkedIn, you'll be able to reach people who do. Get a $100 credit on your next ad campaign. Go to linkedin.com slash results to claim your credit. That's linkedin.com slash results. Terms and conditions apply. LinkedIn, the place to be. To be. Hello, I'm Pip, and welcome to the Midwife Pip Podcast, the home of expert information and real chats on all things pregnancy, birth, and beyond. Honestly, one of the most difficult times to educate yourself on breastfeeding is when you're actually doing it. Getting ahead and preparing in pregnancy is a game changer. And this week, I am joined by Danielle Facey, better known as the breastfeeding mentor on social media. Danielle is a breastfeeding educator on a mission to help you feel supported on your breastfeeding journey and to bust the many breastfeeding myths that exist. So welcome back, Danielle, because of course you've been on the podcast before talking about the other end of the spectrum. We talked about stopping breastfeeding, whereas today we get to pick your brains about starting. So thank you for joining me. Yes, indeed. Thank you so much for having me, Pip. It's a pleasure to be back. And yeah, like you said, I think it's a reminder that mums need support at every single stage of breastfeeding um, from preparing to finishing. So yeah, very much hoping to like that gap a little bit. Definitely. And I think the thing with breastfeeding is we often think it's this linear journey. And my mm. goodness, it is absolutely not, is it? It's a complete roller coaster. And I know we were talking before about the fact that, you know, having our, I'm on my second breastfeeding journey now with Alfie, and it is completely different to the <laughs> first. He has thrown me so many curveballs. I kind of thought, I know what I'm doing. <laughs> I did this for 17 months, you know, my body's not even stopped breastfeeding that long ago. We'll all be good. And it's so different, but also just through the life cycle, essentially, of a growing child and things like weaning, teething, illness, daycare, (laughs) returning to work. Like there are so many hurdles on that kind of trajectory of an infant feeding journey that you are so right. We need support throughout the whole lot. And that's what you do so beautifully. Oh, thank you. And we really do. And yeah, like you said, when the breastfeeding mental page and the accounts got started, because when I started to breastfeed, I felt like there really was, I was very fortunate where we lived at the time, there was a lot of in-person support. There was a breastfeeding unit, a short drive from where we lived. Um, And although there wasn't very much support in the hospital, I, I knew that it was accessible, you know, once we were discharged. But that's not the case for every mom. And even though there was that support, a dedicated unit, literally minutes from the house, once we got past six weeks, they were a little bit like, um, why are you calling? <laughs> what, what, what would you like? Because we, we don't work with mums after that long. And I was like, oh, but um, I'm really struggling with this, this and this. And they were like, uh, have you tried, you know, the breastfeeding helpline? And I was like, oh, um. Thanks. That's really, really helpful. And it's, yes, I appreciate, you know, getting breastfeeding off to the best possible start is wonderful. And the vast majority of us do need some kind of often hands-on support with that. Mm. And I think, yeah, there are even areas, you know, in the country where that's lacking. But then beyond that as well, gosh, yeah, like you say, going back to work when your little one's sick, if you have to go on medication, Oh, goodness. Yeah. Let alone stopping. There's just it's it's a whole journey. And like you say, every single one is different. And it sounds really naive, I think, of me to think that when I was preparing to breastfeed myself, I didn't really appreciate that my son was his own person. (laughs) He wasn't just 
a baby that came out would come out and do the same thing that every baby does and they nurse in the same way and no actually every single baby every single breast <laughs> every single mother and baby dyad is completely unique so whether you've had no children yet or eight <laughs> you can't predict what your breastfeeding journey will be like with the baby that you're maybe carrying now and I think just knowing that fact and knowing that it's normal for it to be a process in the early days, it's normal to have a few hiccups, to need a little bit of support is really empowering because then you don't panic and think, oh, right, you know, I can't do this now because we've come to a bump in the road. No, actually, the vast majority of mums do experience a face thumb challenge, you know, initially at least. Um, but with support, it's typically possible to push through, even if it's, you know, only potentially partially breastfeeding, if that's what you want to do. And I think it's important to get across that breastfeeding doesn't have to be all or nothing either. You know, this, the breast is breast message is so strong. And I, you know, I really do understand why, you know, it's, it's such a positive, it's such a, you know, it's such a movement really. Um, but at the same time, if for whatever reason, because you have insufficient glandular tissue or you've had breast surgery or I don't know, for myriad reasons, you simply are not able to provide your baby with all of the milk that they need exclusively. It's OK to do a bit of both. You know, every single drop of breast milk literally contains millions of white blood cells to boost your little one's immunity. So for as long as breastfeeding is important to you and it matters to you and it's what you want to do I really think that you should be supported to do that in any capacity you know whatever that looks like for your unique family your unique breasts and your unique circumstances <laughs> my brand new book midwife pip's guide to a positive birth is now available so much more than a book this is a guide that allows me to hold your hand through your birth preparation journey. With over a decade of experience and knowledge packed in to ensure you really are empowered in the way you deserve to achieve a positive birth, regardless of the twists and turns that crop up. Make sure that you get your hands on Midwife Pip's Guide to a Positive Birth Book now and are empowered to have the birth experience that you deserve. Definitely, that's such a beautiful message to get across. And, you know, mm. I totally agree. Of course, it's really important that we educate on the, you know, multifaceted, incredible benefits of breastfeeding for mums mm. and babies and health outcomes and all of that. I didn't know anyone listening that hasn't, doesn't know that breastfeeding is good for them and their baby. Like we have shouted that from the rooftops, haven't we? Like <laughs> it's incredible. However, I think what we have not done is invested the same amount of, you know, money, energy, campaign efforts into actually helping people do it, which just <laughs> leads to all of that guilt, doesn't it? There's a reason that the breastfeeding rates at six weeks are dropping through the floor compared mm. to those initiation rates because it's the support. Like those statistics are glaringly obvious in what's missing in society, isn't it? It's, you know, it's not a surprise. And I think any mums that you you speak to, I know things I often hear is, I couldn't for X, Y, Z reason. And I always, mm. I always kind of inside feel really cross for them because I think actually mm -hmm. they were hurdles that were totally figure outable or things you could have worked around had mm. you have had the support. And I think that's why the topic we're talking about today in terms of that pre-preparation is so important mm. because at the time it is so much more difficult to gather that information, that knowledge, that support, that empowerment in the depths of the fourth trimester compared yes. to if you had that information and you already understood your body in the way that you deserve to as a woman, really, I think. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, you just, you're taking the words right out of my mouth, Pip. I couldn't agree more. You know, you, like you said, every mother deserves the opportunity to breastfeed in whatever capacity, you know, is available to her for as long as she chooses but it's almost it's it's very rare actually that a mum doesn't need some kind of support some kind of intervention however minimal that may be and I think if we can normalize that normalize the fact that 
you know, you're likely to need support and normalize just what the breastfeeding experience looks like, looks like generally too. That will be a game changer. And like you said, just having that little bit of information really, yeah, it can be so powerful and having it before you're in the depths of the fourth trimester. Um, I remember so clearly when my little boy was about, I think he was about four or five months old at the time and he was very much a food monster. This particular day we'd made it to the play group. I was very proud, very chuffed with myself. And of course he was attached to me the whole time. And I sat next to a lady who I'd chatted to a few other times and she said, oh, you know, I couldn't breastfeed. And I said, oh, no, I'm so sorry about that. It's, you know, it's really special to me. And she said, yeah, my daughter was just on me, you know, for an hour or two at a time. And I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, that it does happen. She was like, no, 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 like, you know, two hours at a time. I was like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, very much like that. And she just sort of looked at me like, no, no, you're not understanding what I'm saying. And I was like, yeah. I know, I, I really do know it, it happens. And I just thought, oh God, and she just, she literally stood up and just moved away from me. And I was like, oh God, <laughs> this is what we were. I was like, yeah, new mom friend. But that that gap in knowledge and understanding mm-hmm. in just knowing what cluster feeding was, for goodness sake. And, you yeah. know, if, she, if only she'd been introduced to that term and had known that it's very, very normal and, you know, completely developmentally appropriate nursing behaviour, particularly for a newborn, to be at the breast for a couple of hours at a time, sometimes, Um, you know, and every single baby has a slightly different way of nursing and different patterns of nursing, and particularly when they're so tiny, even if the only message that anyone listening to this gets is that, yeah, every single baby is so different and they're normal and their nursing patterns and what's normal for them, just it isn't predictable and it's so variable, even if that's the only message that a mum takes away so that she can know if she has a baby, for instance, who only nurses once roughly every three hours for 40 to, 42 minutes to an hour at a time. And her friend at antenatal class has a baby who nurses for... 10 minutes every 20 minutes if she just knows that's normal it's fine you know it's not necessarily a problem um and that yeah just, just the variability is huge and it's fast but um if you understand how breastfeeding works then you're just so much more empowered and then you can identify if there are issues and so on so for anyone who doesn't know already I think really helpful to know that about two really important breastfeeding hormones. So prolactin, which is triggered to be released from your brain whenever your baby nurses. So that means every single time your baby is at the breast, your brain is sending a message to your breast to make more milk. And just understanding that very simple message shows you hopefully that every time your baby nurses, they're triggering your body to make more milk, to create more milk, to perhaps meet the demands of them having a growth spurt or, you know, them being in a lot of pain or your supply, increasing your supply after a period of sickness or something like that. Knowing that the act of them being at the breast and nursing is really important for maintaining and establishing your supply in the beginning is vital because if you've never heard of cluster feeding, and I don't know, let's say you're, you know, you're at home, you've got four week old and got friends or family over, and they just happen to have all exclusively formula fed, and they see that you're sitting there and your baby's been on the breast for an hour and a half, they may, you know, say things like, gosh, do you think they're getting enough? Or, mm. you know, maybe you've not quite got enough milk. They've been on the boob for a long time. Yes. And that's normal, you know, and it, it's only problematic. And, you know, if you're in pain, if your baby isn't gaining weight at the expected rate, if they're dehydrated and you're not seeing enough wet or dirty nappies for their particular age. And if none of those things are applicable, you're comfortable, baby's comfortable, they're just on you all the time. It's not, you know, it's not a problem. It's biologically and physiologically physiologically very normal nursing behavior um and yeah because for various reasons so many of the previous generation 
didn't necessarily have any breastfeeding experience. There's lots of myths out there, and but having a fundamental understanding that every time your baby nurses, your breasts are getting this message that they need to make more milk, I think is a crucial one. Mm. And the other important hormone to know about is oxytocin. If you're pregnant, you've probably heard about that a lot. You know, <laughs> the love hormone, the cuddle hormone, it's all about bonding and closeness. And it literally helps your milk to flow. So the fact that maybe your six week old wants to be on you all the time, it's not a bad thing. It's not a sign that there's anything wrong. It's, you know, it's really good for your milk production actually and to help getting your milk flowing um, and to help you hopefully feel well and good and rested and Mm -hmm. to drift back to sleep after night feeds and so on. Um, And it, I think, again, for various reasons, we're a little bit obsessed with independence in this country, certainly, probably in the US as well, I would say. Um, but actually, even as an adult, I'm pretty reliant on my mom. <laughs> you know, <laughs> she's with childcare and just general life advice. And none of us are islands, and particularly not our tiny newborns. They they are very dependent, and that's not another myth, is that, you know, breastfed babies are more needy. No, they're just, you know, signaling to mom that maybe they need a little bit more milk and that's okay. It's normal. It's natural. It's nothing to be worried about. And yeah, as soon as you have a toddler, just you try and stop them being independent. Yeah, I was going to say, I finally was breastfed for a a fairly decent amount of time. And now at two and a half, Mm. he is the fiercely most (laughs) independent. I do it myself. No, leave me. Get off toddler ever. (laughs) But I loved what you were saying there, Danielle, because I think I've shared on on the podcast before that with my firstborn, I am very clear that had I have not been a midwife and had the understanding that I have on the early side of breastfeeding, day mm. five is where our breastfeeding journey would have ended. And mm. we ended up feeding for 17 months until Finley just kind of self-weaned, to be honest. But yeah. that is absolutely where it would have ended because like you were saying, I come, my husband's um, mum was, it had three boys and she breastfed them all. So their their side of the family and my husband's understanding, because he was the eldest of three, was very breastfeeding focused, which was great. My side of the family is very bottle feeding focused. And I remember my mum saying to me, even with me being a midwife, um, he's feeding so much. You know, yeah. you must, like you're saying, you must not be giving him enough. This isn't normal. Do you not think he just needs a little bit, just like a little top up of some formula and then yeah. maybe he'll sleep better. Maybe you'll get more rest. I remember that conversation. And at that point I was like, oh, you know, unhelpful advice in one ear out the other. But had I not been, mm-hmm. had the knowledge I have, and that was my only influence, I probably would have gone, oh yeah, maybe he's st- he's starving. Maybe I'm not giving my baby enough. And those that have been following me for a while will have seen pictures of baby Finley, who was absolutely massive. Rolls within <laughs> rolls within rolls. So there was absolutely no way that he was not getting enough milk because he was humongous. So that was very reassuring <laughs> and, and as time went on. But I remember that influence. And I just think, yes, that is why it's so important we address this in pregnancy and that women actually understand their bodies and one of the things I wanted to kind of touch on with you today Danielle is boobs are clearly amazing aren't they (laughs) we uh thank goodness for them but I wonder if you could explain a little bit about how they actually prepare in pregnancy for breastfeeding because I think often when you know that even without you noticing your body's been making this incredible preparation kind of just instills that bit of extra confidence in you doesn't it as a, as a new oh, breastfeeding yeah. mum yeah so anyone who's pregnant right now and listening to this or hoping to be you know if you're past around the first trimester then your boobs have already started to make colostrum you know way before your baby arrives and they're already gearing up for the moment that your baby is born. And, you know, the whole, it really does start then. And then, uh, you know, the uh, alveoli cells in your breasts are increasing and they're filling with milk. And as you progress and you go into labor, it's like a, a chain reaction and your breasts are gearing up and all of these hormonal shifts and changes are happening 
to let your boobs know, right, the baby's here, let's get making that milk. And, you know, I think another important aspect of kind of setting yourself up to be able to breastfeed as best you can is to understand the importance of golden hour. If you, you know, if you possibly can have it, just again, that just kind of flows from this natural, almost chain reaction of events from giving birth and your progesterone, progesterone and estrogen levels plummeting. And then as you start to breastfeed, your prolactin and oxytocin levels surging. And all of that playing a role in getting your breasts ready and to make milk and to nurse your baby. And so, yeah, if you're thinking about your birth plan at the moment and you're worried about producing enough milk because, you know, maybe you've got friends whose boobs are leaking colostrum and they have been for months, you know, that's not necessarily a sign that, you know, of your milk supply, it's completely irrelevant. Equally, the size of your breasts is completely irrelevant. You know, you might be an A cup with, I don't know, let's say, eight different branches of these alveoli cells if you imagine oh, i'm a good a cup i'm only an yeah. a cup here and we're breastfeeding <laughs> yeah, irrelevant you know i yeah i de- it was definitely a concern of mine in pregnancy i was yeah maybe maybe a b on a good day you know <laughs> and <laughs> it doesn't matter it's, it's completely irrelevant you might be an a cup with eight different branches of these alveoli cells where the milk is made we might be a g cup with two and you know, really, it's irrelevant. Um, and, you know, your baby, when your baby is born, they learn the breast that they get, you know. So, again, every breast has a different capacity for holding milk, storing milk, um, will make milk at a different speed. And you and your baby have to find a rhythm that works for your both, you know, for your baby's appetite and the rate at which your, at which your breast produce milk and the capacity you know at which they hold milk it's it's very much a dance between mother and child and yeah really just emphasizing how completely individual it is to each mother and and baby diet you know there really isn't kind of one rule that fits all but you know it, it is applicable that every breast makes milk in response to um that pro- prolactin being produced and being stimulated and the oxytocin releasing the milk and that that cycle happening and continuing so you know there are all these there are so many products on the market that claim to boost milk production and you know potentially maybe some of them do and there's lots of anecdotal evidence and maybe they've worked for you know half the mums that you meet at a, a baby group but to date there isn't any evidence that supports that you know but we do know that irrespective of your breast size or shape and so on the more you milk, you remove milk from your breasts, the more yeah milk your breasts will produce. Um, it's as simple as that. It's almost oversimplified, and I think we often overcomplicate things. But you know, it's it really is as straightforward as if you nurse more often or pump more often, your breasts will make more milk. And you know, even if you you have a true low supply your breasts will make as much milk as they possibly can if you nurse or pump more frequently and you're getting as much sleep as you possibly can. You're eating well, you're getting enough calories, you know, you're hydrated and you're not overly stressed. Mm -hmm. Um, Then, yeah, your body and your breasts will make as much milk as they can um, in response to the demand that your baby is placing on them. Um, And I think, yeah, again, like you said, talking about, the prevalence of formula and norms and practices with nursing you know potentially every three or four hours that was certainly the advice when probably when we were babies and so it's the advice that many grandparents will be offering now and we yeah. know that actually you know if you're breastfeeding and breastfeeding exclusively that advice is almost to how to make sure that you don't make enough milk necessarily yeah. because yeah if your baby's not placing that demand demand on your breast then they can't respond. So, yeah, having a fundamental understanding of the importance of responsive feeding, knowing that irrespective of how much your breasts do or don't change in pregnancy, that they are making milk, even if it's not leaking out, or even if you struggle to hand express colostrum, if you've been thinking about that, 
you've spoken about that and you know given the all go to do the the, the all clear to do that beyond 37 weeks of pregnancy and you're struggling I very much did I couldn't get anything out um but then had a huge oversupply which I couldn't have anticipated um and I think just realizing that and understanding that irrespective of what your labor looks like too you know I very much had this idea that I was going to just on my son out in, you know, this like a room filled with scented lemongrass and lavender and so on. And in the end, it was just so very different from how I imagined. And I was in labour for four days and I ended up developing sepsis and I had an emergency section and didn't know before I had my little boy that having the section might delay my milk coming in too that it would come it just is about day five for me mm. which again you know if you just have no idea that that's normal and can happen you might be thinking well <laughs> I'm only getting a few mils of colostrum this can't be enough for my baby and how um, often do we hear women say I just didn't have enough milk or my milk never uh, came in and it again it comes down to that pre-education doesn't it and mm. I and I loved what you said about the the overcomplicating sometimes of breastfeeding mm. and I think I think part of that probably comes down to, like you alluded to, that comparison element. Yeah. And we almost assume there's going to be a problem. Whereas if we can just assume that our body and our baby will know what to do and follow their lead. I um, I took Alfie for a tongue-tie division and I said to the midwife then, will you just check my latch? Because I still don't actually think I know how to breastfeed because I've just basically followed the boy's lead. And just yeah. kind of gone with it. And she was like, well, that's the perfect thing to do. Uh, yes. Oh, yeah, of course. So without, I think sometimes we just overcomplicate it. And actually, it is something we can allow some instinct to come into. And actually, if oh. our babies are going to feed constantly one day, great. The next day, they might go that magic three, four hours. We're yet to yeah. get there eight weeks in, I have to say. <laughs> but sometimes they might. And that's okay. We eat and drink differently every day, yeah. don't we? And, and they're the same, right? Yeah, and that's okay. I think just, yeah, like you say, just normalising that, mm -hmm. knowing that, yeah, we, as much as we might like to organise our days and have a fixed <laughs> nature doesn't really work that way. And I think that way of being and living in, and mothering intuitively for many of us is very at odds with the world around us. And yeah. It, you know, it could that that's definitely been a real source of conflict for me. And as a teacher, you know, oh gosh, I just cringe when I think about just my my preconceptions. I was I have I look back at like messages I sent in the family WhatsApp group about how I'd gotten my four week old into a routine because for the past two days he'd woken up, done a poo, nursed for this long. And then we sang songs and then it all went out the window and I was like, oh, where's my oh, routine gone? <laughs> I don't know what to do now. We're supposed to, we're supposed to do it, you know, like this and it's supposed yeah. to tick these boxes and fit into this time schedule. And yeah, particularly if you're nursing. <laughs> it doesn't me. work. <laughs> yeah, but there is no schedule. The baby's just the schedule and that's okay. And it's not, not just okay. It's optimal actually um, for maintaining your milk supply and, you know, yes, you know, that will adapt with time, but for as long as you want to keep breastfeeding, you can figure out a way to, you know, to maybe, you know, say you go back to work, maybe you only nurse first thing in the morning and just before bedtime or, you know, just knowing and yeah, knowing that your body will adapt, that your little one will adapt, that you'll find a new rhythm mm. and what nursing looks like at the beginning is, you know, it might be very different you know, in a year's time, if you're still going, um, and that's okay too. You needn't worry, and if you if you can tune into your instincts, then I think you're doing, yeah, a better job than I managed to do. I really struggled with that. Um, but yeah, I, I do think that you know that that routine element is a massive one for parents. And again, I think often that comes down to the media and social media, and everywhere you look, there are sleep schedules, and this is what my baby's doing, and that's what my baby's doing. And it's really unhelpful. And actually, I often say to parents, there will come a time where your child usually thrives off a routine. I know once our toddler was probably, I don't know, six, eight months, actually, he really thrived off having a routine. It really made an impact if his nap time was an hour late. 
you saw it in his behavior mm-hmm. and it and and his ability to you know wean and things like that and it actually becomes really debilitating i mm-hmm. find the routine for finley now a bit restrictive if i'm honest you know if he's not in the bath by six o'clock then bedtime becomes like really dramatized whereas it's super (laughs) smooth if he's in the bath at six but that's really limiting because it means if we want to go out for dinner we have to book a table at five and it can't be too far away and you know in that time it means you either got to be in the pram or the car or at home for a nap and that honestly i promise to anyone listening that is like craving a routine in the early days there will come a point where the routine Uh becomes a bit of a pain So embrace the fact that you can go to the pub at nine o'clock at night with a newborn baby and nurse in the pub. And that's fine. You know, actually that flexibility, I love. I remember going on a hiking holiday when Finley was a baby and we were sat having a roast dinner after a long day walking, probably at about half past nine o'clock, half past nine, 10 o'clock with a big roast dinner, like just sat there by an open fire. And it was amazing. And I remember thinking when we planned a second, we'll never be able to do that. Because we're still going to have a toddler that needs a routine. So actually embracing that complete, some would say chaos, but I feel like my life's chaos anyway, so it's probably why I'm comfortable with it. But embracing that complete flexibility that if you want to meet a friend for a coffee at whatever time of day, you can, as long as you've got your boobs with you, you're good to go. Yeah. <laughs> it really is okay. And yeah, nursing in public is another one which I think many mums feel anxiety around in the early day early days I definitely did but just you know knowing little tricks like even if your baby doesn't accept a, a kind of traditional cover over their head if you have I don't you know like a, just a scarf that you can drape across your chest yeah. no one needs to see anything or if you've got a, if you wear a top underneath um another top so it's called the one up one down method and you wear a vest top underneath say a jumper and then you just lower the vest top, get your boob out, lift up the jumper. No one can see anything. Right. You know, it doesn't have to be, doesn't have to be this whole performance and you don't have to be getting a whole boob out if you don't want to. But similarly, if you are comfortable and that's how it, that's what works for you, that's fine too. You know, breastfeeding is protected by law in the UK across, you know, all 50 US states, I think Australia as well. Um in many European countries, it's not necessarily protected by law, but it's just normal. So it yeah. doesn't need law. Um, We've all seen it, boobs before. That's what I always think. We've all <laughs> seen boobs and mine really are no different to anyone else's. So. Exactly. <laughs> Everyone wants to see boobs until there's a baby attached to them. Yeah, so, yeah it's so true, isn't it? It's so true. It's so funny, that dynamic. I feel like I was really discreet with Finley and I always made sure I had like nursing clothes on, you know, special, you know, you can get beautiful clothing now, can't you? In in the kind of nursing accessibility. I had all of that. Um, And with Alfie, I think I just get my boob out, to be honest. He also is, and we were saying about them being so different. Finley would have probably breastfed with anything over his head. He was completely unbothered as long as he was on the boob. Whereas (laughs) for Alfie, the boob has to be completely clear. Even if my bra is like slightly covering or like, getting close to his eye he gets really fussy so it is just oh, easier to get my whole boob out for him. Yeah. and it's and, and it's again it comes back to that thing of everyone's journey is different and in motherhood there is yeah. so much comparison about everything uh-huh. and feeding completely falls into that trap that it's important I think just to refocus sometimes on your journey and your unique path absolutely I think just a very quick tip on that no, is to I, f- I found journaling very helpful, often very publicly <laughs> via the page. But um, yeah. <laughs> just for kind of just because I think you know we live in such a noisy world, just to kind of dig deep and tune into what it is that you want, tune into your own body. You know, if you're getting advice left, right, and center, not necessarily from experts, but just you know all and sundry. Yeah. Quite frankly. <laughs> Absolutely, every day. Just shouts unsolicited advice at you. Journaling, I found very helpful. Just kind of tracking your thoughts, um, even if it's yeah, just a minute in the morning, to help you just kind of recenter and tune into your own voice <laughs> amidst the noise. That can be really helpful and just kind of help you find your rhythm, whatever that is for you and your family, because it's just such a huge transition and. Yeah, again, coming back to this message of breast is best being everywhere. Yes, we hear it all the time, but actually in reality, 
the support then once your babies are born isn't necessarily yeah it, it isn't doesn't necessarily exist unfortunately um so yeah particularly if you you have unsupportive friends family members sometimes even a partner who's unsupportive i think education is so incredibly empowering and for you to know that actually no it's completely natural and normal for for instance um <laughs> day two syndrome it's often known as day two syndrome it's actually day five for us but whenever you're <laughs> typically when your milk comes in very normal for your baby to literally be up all night nursing on and off the whole night I still have the notes on my phone it was between 10 p.m and about 5 30 and I was convinced as a new mom who really just didn't understand much about breastfeeding that something was wrong and I sent my poor fiance out to various pharmacies buying dummies and gripe water and all sorts of yeah stuff that we didn't need at all and if I just you know if I just read that oh right this is normal and it's just you know my baby letting me know that he's growing and my milk's come in and he's really hungry and thirsty and it's helping to establish my supply then I might have relaxed a little bit and yeah, yeah just had a cup of tea and a pack of biscuits and gone with it right like exactly yeah lean into it. That, get yourself a, a water bottle and yeah just just go with it because it won't be forever I know that it feel certainly felt like it that particular yeah. night at the time but it really won't be and yeah as it's such a cliche every single person says it every parent says it but time really does fly and before you know it you know it's easier to keep breastfeeding than to stop and so yeah, yeah I think having the, the knowledge and the confidence to just find whatever your rhythm is as a family is yeah I think I would hope that I'd hope that for I would wish that for anyone who's listening and I I am um, I love I love your tip on journaling. One of the things that I do is I always think if I'm struggling with something, what would I do if nobody else ever knew? What decision would I then make if no one ever knew what decision I was making? So I think that again just brings you back to your core values and and what's important to you amongst that noisy space, doesn't it? That it, that kind of exists. And yeah, it's it's it, we're in a really difficult societal time with feeding and I think I I find my heart really breaks for those mums that stop breastfeeding at around that six week mark especially when we know it's out of lack of support and that's because you've essentially done the hardest bit once yeah. you are you know set up it really yeah. does become the easiest way of feeding in terms of practicality finances and then you reap all those benefits to start with it can be really hard not for everybody but for lots of people it can be really, really hard. And often we just tip, tiptoeing on that edge before it's about to get easier when we stop. And I just think yeah. that feels so, so, so unfair for, for women that stop at that stage. It really is. And I think the statistics are that it's about, well, the, the most recent ones that we have are it's about 80% of mums stop breastfeeding before they really wanted to, which I just think is absolutely heartbreaking. Um it meant so much to me and I didn't realize how much it would mean to me until for I was born and then even I don't know I just turned into this like tiger mama bear you know who was like I'm gonna keep going for as long as I want and I won't have anyone tell me what I'm gonna do this is my mother this is my child and yeah fiercely protective of it and it's just yeah it's so deeply sad when so many moms just don't have the option when just a little bit of information and support would make, you know, the world of difference. Mm. Um, understanding how breastfeeding works, knowing common, you know, common challenges, busting myths, and yeah, being able to recognise when actually no, I I do need help here. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I I can't just push through. I think there's definitely a, concept, a misconception that. If you just, you know, you just keep going, if you're just determined enough, it'll work. But actually, just because, you know, best reading's natural, it's not necessarily always instinctive. And with issues like oral ties or, you know, inverted nipples for anyone who's had breast surgery, you know, all of these things, yes, they might make breastfeeding really challenging in the early days. But again, you know, your baby will learn the breasts that they get. 
Yeah. You just might need a little bit of extra support. So if you know that in advance, you can plan for it, maybe budget for a local IBCLC, someone you can meet while you're still pregnant, perhaps, so that, you know, when it comes to the time when you're just sitting on the sofa with your boobs out, it's a bit more comfortable. <laughs> yeah. And that's wonderful, you know, and just to prepare it's a great for- baby shower gift as well, isn't it? You don't need a thousand oh baby grows. You really don't. Or, or a baby hat and mittens. They, you really don't need them. Whereas actually something practical like that is a game changer. Indeed. Yeah. So yeah, to anyone listening, if breastfeeding is important to you, invest in it now. Find, just Google a local lactation consultant. Um, just so you, know, you may not ever need them. That's fine. Just have their number, you know, maybe know how much they charge. Um Tell your partner as well, if you have one or your birthing partner or your support network that if I'm struggling and I'm sleep deprived and I can't really think straight, this is the person who can help me with breastfeeding. Please remember that yeah. because, you know, you might not necessarily. And I get lots of queries all the time online. And while I can always offer, you know, information and education on breastfeeding, if you, you know, sometimes you really do just need a little bit of hands-on support, a bit yeah. of adjustment, a squish of the boob, you know, and that's it. So I would always recommend hands-on support from, you know, could be a peer supporter. Maybe there's a, a breastfeeding peer support group near you yeah. or a breastfeeding counsellor. Kind of the gold standard is an IBCLC, an international board certified lactation consultant, because they've had over a thousand hours of they have a medical background and then over a thousand hours of literally hands on support for yes. breastfeeding moms. So please, you know, if you're struggling at any point, don't just think, you know, oh, I just can't do it. You know, if you if you want to carry on and it's important to you, just ask for some help. And it's, easy, it's certainly easier said than done, um, but it's so worthwhile. I can't tell you, you know, how much her journey means to me even now just how precious those memories are and you know whether you have one child or seven every journey is so different and so precious and it's finite you know whether it's six weeks or 16 um, 16 months you know six years maybe it's mm. every it's so precious because it doesn't last forever they will grow up at some point um but hopefully again with a bit of information and and education it can be on your terms rather than left to chance. Mm. And I think obviously I work with lots of pregnant mums, Danielle. And I think if you're mm-hmm. a pregnant mum listening to this and think, I want to breastfeed if I can, because that's something I always hear. If I can, I really want to breastfeed. Then I just oh. want you to know that you absolutely can. There is yeah. no way that you can't breastfeed. And so Danielle's advice in terms of find that person now You know, even if you're listening at eight weeks pregnant, just find that person now that's going to support you because you can. The limiting thing is going to be support and understanding, not perceived low milk supply or all these other factors that often we hear. They're really not the reason. The reason is the support and education. So the Mm. the kind of real thing, if you're listening as as a pregnant listener, you can breastfeed. You really can. You just need to know what you need to know and often we don't know what we don't know until we find out so getting that support in early is going to change the game for you absolutely now Danielle everyone that comes on the podcast I always ask for three top tips and you've already given us loads but if you could share your kind of three top tips perhaps to someone who is listening and wanting to breastfeed when their baby arrives yeah so first and foremost information and education just Again, like you said, you don't know what you don't know until you know it. And, you know, irrespective of what your breasts are like now, whether you have flat nipples, whether you've had breast surgery, you have insufficient glandular tissue, the likelihood is the vast majority of moms really can exclusively breastfeed. Equally, the vast majority of moms will need support at some point. Just knowing that, first and foremost, is yeah essential. But any information that you can garner around starting breastfeeding, you know, what to expect in terms of breastfeeding behavior to empower yourself is just going to be so worthwhile because, yeah, just kind of going into it blindly. It, yeah, it's, it's what I did. And it was without, again, just access to support. I just wouldn't have been able to breastfeed. And I know that not 
everyone has the access that I was fortunate to have. But if I'd had the information, I would have known, ah, right, when this happens, I need to get help. If I'm experiencing pain, I need to get help and so on. Which brings me on to my next tip. You know, if you experience pain at all, in, you know, particularly in the early days, get help. Don't expect that it's just going to magically resolve itself. Occasionally it might, and your baby might just figure out, you and your baby will just figure out a deeper latch. But it could be a sign that your little one has oral ties, that, you know, it could be positioning issues and that you could do with just, again, a little bit of hands-on support that you would never have stumbled across yourself. So, yeah, if you're in pain at all, get help as soon as you possibly can because, yeah, a lactation professional will be able to help you and it could just be that tiny little bit of of intervention that makes the difference between you being able to breastfeed you know, potentially for years and not being able to breastfeed at all. Mm-hmm. And then having that really sad regret that I know so many mums have. You know, my mum, she's 60, how old is my mum? 60, nearly 63. She's 53, no, she's nearly 64. And even, you know, now deeply regrets the fact that she was told that she couldn't breastfeed twins. She didn't even try and wasn't supported at all. Even though she wanted to, was just said, oh gosh, you can't breastfeed, you're gonna be having twins, you know, and she was oh, okay. And that's a regret for her even now, which is so sad. Um, so yeah, education, um, getting help. And I think the third tip would be finding community. Mm-hmm. So finding whether that's in person or online, just because yeah so much there's so much competition sadly in motherhood and there's so much differing advice there are so many comparisons if you're all in the same boat and you find a community of moms who are breastfeeding in person at a a breastfeeding group then just so much is normalized and you can talk about the challenges and the struggles without fear of judgment without excluding that lady who you really liked who just doesn't want to hear about the hard time you're having with breastfeeding because she desperately wanted to and and, and couldn't. So yeah, community is, is a game changer. You know, we were never meant to do anything in isolation, least of all motherhood um, and nursing. And we can just learn so much from each other. Um, you don't need to be lactation trained to be able to offer someone moral support and to share stories and to find common ground. Um, so yeah, educate yourself. Get help if you're worried, if you're concerned at any stage, but always if you're experiencing pain and find community, whether that's in person or online, because it's just it's a game changer knowing that you're not alone. Because, yeah, as as difficult as it is to experience any challenges as a new mom, when you realize that you're not the first to experience it and that actually there's a whole community of moms who've had exactly the same issues as me and these are their tips it's just so helpful it takes the weight off it can I think it can release guilt as well um and hopefully just help you enjoy breastfeeding a little bit more 100 I often say when women support women amazing things happen and that oh. completely correlates to breastfeeding Danielle thank you so much for your time and reassuring words and expertise we're really grateful to have you back on the podcast talking about this other end of the breastfeeding journey so thank you thank you so much Pip and I wanted to offer um a special deal for your listeners so yeah anyone who listens I have a new guide it's called preparing to breastfeed and you can use the code midwife pip to get 50% off so very big juicy discount it's a 95 page guide full of everything I've spoken about plus a lot more um it busts myths and just helps it will give you a sound understanding you and your partner and you know anyone who's going to be in your support network how breastfeeding works what's normal and when to get help yeah perfect oh that's super super kind Danielle thank you so much and for anyone who wants to take Danielle up on that very kind offer head to the episode description where you can be linked through to her details to get your hands on that thank you so much I'll speak to you soon thank you one last thing before you go as a listener really help make this podcast successful I would appreciate if you could subscribe and leave a quick review. 
Something so little means so much to me and will help so many women's lives. 